Hi everyone, uh, I'm Larry Roche. I've been bird watching Cleveland area longer than you want to know. And uh, I've worked for the Department of Natural Areas and Preserves for the state of Ohio. And now I'm uh, employed by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and their Natural Areas Division. And we do nature every day, seven days a week, all year long. And uh, you want to learn something? Come on some of our trips that Judy Semrock and I lead. We will not disappoint. We've been doing this for a long time. Judy and I have been partners in the field for at least 15 years. And uh, we are sitting here at West Creek uh, Preserve. And we were here before it was a preserve. And we were part of the people that came out and did some studies and, and before the Metro Parks picked it up. And that's the kind of things uh, that we do for right now. Those people that are really good bird watchers have uh, a couple of books that we've written, uh, Birds in Cleveland Region, and uh, Dragonflies and Damselflies in Northeast Ohio, which is a highly acclaimed book, and got a lot of people writing regional guides because the dragonflies, some are very widespread, but most are very, very site-specific and indicators of what you can find and lots of different things in a particular nature. But we're basically nature nuts and uh, we've been around a long time. I, I've been blessed with the bird watching stuff. I, I think the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and the Cleveland Kirtland Bird Club and all those things that we have had a great, great history of bird watching in this region, hundreds years plus. It is not just since the handheld devices showed up, eBird, iNaturalist, and all those things. There were many, many great bird watchers long before me. And you have to go to the archives. And if you go to the Kirtland Bird Club website, you can find a lot of information going back to 1905. And some of the dearest people that ever walked and gave their entire career, pencil and paper, of course, and they knew how to write cursively. I always find it interesting that people don't write cursively anymore. So we did a lot of bird watching over the years, and Lake Erie is among the biggest and best, and we have to learn to protect it from a lot of outside development and things like that, or everything will be gone. When we do work for the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and we tell people that we work at the natural areas, I can remember Ken Kaufman speaking at the museum several years back and he made reference to the fact that he's been in many, many, many museums and we're the only one that it's a living museum. And we protect things for the future. We protect land. We have over 5,000 acres, probably pushing 6,000 acres by now. We have active people, David Kriska and Keith Moran, Becky Donaldson under Jim Bissell uh, are working to save Menor Marsh or return Menor Marsh uh, to its prior status before it became um, Menor Phragmites Marsh. And uh, they have just spent so much time writing grants and stuff like that. Whereas we also have all these properties that we lead trips to, different ones, and there aren't that many trails on them, and there's lots of poison ivy, and we can, we can show you some of the best deer flies you ever wanted to get a hold of. But uh, they're very, very wonderful sites, and they're all through northeast Ohio, from Huron County on over to Ashtabula County. So uh, anytime you want, just look up the museum uh, website and go to adult field trips, and you'll find something there. I'm sure it'll just please you. Other than that, uh, I am, you know, I'm involved with the Peterson Field Guide series. I'm very proud. I got to work on Roger Torrey Peterson's books and do the maps for those books uh, after Roger passed to the other side and Virginia passed to the other side. And uh, I've just been very, very blessed here to be a part of all this.
Now, I've been asked many times, how did I get involved with all of this? And it's hard to say. I, I grew up in the 50s, and when we played baseball, we were outside. Our handheld device was a Lewis, Louisville Slugger. Uh, we were just outside, and we noticed things. We would notice killdeer trying to nest on second base. And what are we going to do? Move the whole field? Uh, little beetles running across the ground. Like, wow, those are pretty cool. They're green, and they jump up, and they run. And the birds, different things. We were, we've watched all these birds disappear from different grassland areas, then come reappear after the strip mines and come back. And uh, It's a hard thing to tell people how to choose a path. you got to want to do it. You gotta like, oh, wonder what that is. And you just sit there and you watch it. You know, when a little chipping sparrow comes walking across the pavement here at the, in the picking ground, uh, I notice. I look down there and I say, oh, that's a youngster. He's got little streaks on and stuff like that. Uh, it's watching them. I think I've watched bird watching change, especially since the internet. I know I'm really dating myself. The internet's been around quite a while, but it's become a game. I got more birds than you, and things like that, or uh, it, it just has uh, just turned into something that no one lasts. That you come out to the meetings and so, and a lot of young people are doing stuff, but they don't join the meetings, they don't join the groups, and they all have their ways of doing stuff. And I'm not saying there aren't some really good young bird watchers. There are really, really hot shots out there. And I wish that they understand that it's their responsibility to carry on, which is going to cost them some dollars. They are going to have to donate. They're going to have to be involved, volunteer. Um, and it's hard, you know. And with the Internet and these little different things, and, you know, it's, it's taken a little bit from me, but it's nothing I can stop, and I'm not trying to stop it. Uh, so if you're going to do bird watching or any kind of science, uh, we have had some really good people to talk to. You could talk to Dr. Ben Winger. He was a Kirtland Bird Club member. I mean, they used to come to the Kirtland Bird Clubs, and their parents would bring them. Nick Barber. These people have gone on to study in South America and Nicaragua, Central America, all over the world, and, and find new species. And these are young people that were... Cleveland area people. Uh, I remember Jenny Brumfield when she was seven years old and I brought her up to the lakefront for the first time. And wow, what a bird watcher that little kid was. And we just said, there's the future. And I, I'm so proud to see Jen working here at the Metro Parks and, and doing the leadership role that you have to assume. Some of us were just born to be out front. And you gotta take it. That's the way it goes, you know. Uh, you have to learn to write. You have to produce. You gotta keep going. You, the older people just can't be the ones doing the editing, um, running the meetings. The young people can. Pat Lucas Patadinkamus, I think that's how I say that. Pardon me for that. And uh, he's been great. But you know, they're all growing up now. They all want to go away and get girlfriends. You know what happens after that. So we like that, and I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to advise people, but uh, things are great here in Cleveland, and I just hope it continues on. Okay, I keep getting asked, how did I get started in this? And, it's hard to say. I meant I was a baseball player. That's all I was. I was playing baseball all the way through college, after college, bike riding, and I met Bert Sabo. Bert Sabo talked to me about some things, and we'd be riding bicycles, and I'd tell him, well, there's a green heron. And he said, where? And he would scream and yell at me, and he'd think, well, you didn't see anything. And I'd show him that old Larry could see stuff. And we would get that together, and then when get with Bert, you go out and you'd see the birds, and he would tell you the plants because he was a botanist. And then we would meet other people who would show us the butterflies, and then the moths, the big silk moths, and then everything. So what I would suggest is you just look at everything. 
if you haven't held a beetle in your hand, or if you missed out on that 17-year cicada this year, where you could pick them up and see that some of them have blue eyes, some of them have this this awful, awful mold, which this is the first year that they've been able to prove that it comes out 17 years with crazy locusts. And those kinds of things are still left. Study dragonflies. They're, they're, we're still 100 years behind in knowing what dragonflies are where. And everything. The butterflies are so susceptible to lawn chemicals. Stop the lawn chemicals. Grow dandelions. You'll find that no one on your football team gets cancer anymore. None of you get dogs with cancer on the feet. Okay? Stop the chemicals. There's just so much that you need to do or just take care of. Not just be a bird watcher, but to be a bird leader. And I really think that that's what this whole situation of the blog, the writing, the newsletters, it's all about that for everybody. And that's about all I got to say to everybody. Thank you for your time.